Okay. So this, this talk is based on work in progress with uh, uh, Tudor Dimovt and Sergei Gukov. And in a sense, this talk is a continuation of, uh, of Sergei's talk. So uh, let me just start from where, he, from where he stopped. So there is this nice class of theories associated to three manifolds. These are three-dimensional conform superconformal field theories with n equals two supersymmetry. And they're defined as the infrared limit of, of a compactification of the six-dimensional theory. Uh, for this talk, it would be just a, a one theory, compactified in some twisted way on this three-manifold. Now, uh, although this is not a complete definition because we don't know how to define the 6D theory, as we have heard a lot about in the in Moore's talk, uh, this is already enough to derive some interesting properties of these theories. Now, one reason for which these theories are interesting is because you could look at them as a very rich invariant of three manifolds. But also, uh, they offer, they, they allow you to construct a very, very large class of fixed points in three dimensions, which is interesting and has a nice geometric interpretation. Now, uh, one of the properties, as Sergei was reviewing, follows very di directly from the fact that the six dimensional theory in a circle is something we understand very well. So the, the model space of vacuum of these theories, TM, when, when compatified on a circle, can be, uh, can be matched against the space of flat connections for us to see on that manifold. And also you saw a, a variant, a sort of a quantum variant of this statement. This is the statement that the partition function of, this, of these theories on an ellipsoid uh, give you the partition function of SL Chuchin Simons theory on the manifold, or at least of some analytic continuation of Chair Simons theory to define in an appropriate way. Now, uh, the, how, there are surely questions which we cannot answer directly because we don't know enough about the six dimensional theory. So it would be nice to have a direct construction of these three dimensional theories. It would be nice to be able to just say, okay, I have these fields, this Lagrangian even. This defines the three-dimensional theory associated to a three-manifold. Now, if you, I mean, one reason to believe this could be done is that we did it before for Riemann surfaces. Starting from the six-dimensional theory on the Riemann surface, you can sort of chop the Riemann surface up into trinions and then identify what four-dimensional theories correspond to each individual trinion and then try to glue, glue them back together. But suppose it, we try to do something like that for a three manifold. Then you take the three manifold, you chop it along Riemann's surface, sort of elongate it. And you, you would get a description of the three dimensional theory as a four dimensional theory on a segment, where in the bulk you find the theory associated to the Riemann surface you cut on. And at the boundaries, you need to find the three dimensional theory, which somehow encodes the, the two halves of the three manifold. Now, the problem is that if you take a generic three manifold and you start chopping it along Riemann surfaces, you're going to get lit fragments of, that are as complicated as the original manifold. I mean, you can somehow cut it into spheres, for example, into S3s, but now inside of these S3s, you're going to find complicated networks of defects. See, in two dimensions, when you cut Riemann surface, you got trinions which had point like defects. But when you cut a three manifold, you find line like defects, and these defects can be knotted. So, this is a problem. This naive approach just, just doesn't work for a generic three manifold. It does work for a very special three manifold. So, Sergei illustrated how you can describe three manifolds which look like a Riemann surface fibered on a circle. Map, so, mapping cylinders. Uh, and there have been some nice work done on, on those, but. Uh, it's not enough to understand a generic three manifold. Now, uh, so the, the, somehow you need to cut the three manifold into enough, even finer pieces so that the individual building blocks are sim simple enough. But to do that, you need to do something more complicated than cutting along nice, clean Riemann surfaces. Uh, so, a source of inspiration was the work of Tudor de Mofte on Chen Simon's theory, where he described the partition partition function by cutting the manifold into tetrahedra, into manifolds manifold with corner, corners. Now, 
in principle, we could uh, now take the six-dimensional theory, try to understand what it means to put it on a tetrahedron, trying to understand what it means to cut it with corners. It seemed to be a lot of work, so we tried to take a shortcut. We just uh, focused on this property, took uh, the Moftes construction of the partition function, and we just engineered a three-dimensional theory uh, such that the ellipsoid partition function gives the right answer. So we ended up with a certain class, an explicit class of three-dimensional conformal field theories, which are just defined by a billion, a billion transamos matten theories. There. So very, very simple theories. Uh, Carrel multiplets, some gauge fields, some superpotentials. The only the superpotentials are the only slightly intricate part of the construction because sometimes you, have to, you are forced to, uh, to write superpotentials which include monopole operators, which are not quite uh, made out of elementary fields. But otherwise, the theories are really, really very simple. And these theories are labeled by exactly the same data that labels Chersamon's partition functions, as a true Chersamon's partition function, pretty much by construction. Uh, now, as I say, I don't know how to describe, I don't know how to derive this construction directly from six dimensions. It would be nice to know how to do it. Uh, we definitely conjecture that these theories correspond to the six to the theories TM. Uh, I think that morally speaking, uh, instead of putting the four-dimensional theory associated with the Riemann surface, the ultra, instead of putting the ultraviolet definition of this four-dimensional theory in terms of SC2 gauge groups and trinions, somehow we are putting or we are putting straight away the cyber written description of the theory putting a billion four-dimensional theories on a segment, and so we, we end up with a billion, some, a billion theories in three dimensions. But uh, I won't be able to make that statement precise. So this is the main, the main result. Let me be a bit more explicit about what is the data these theories depend on. So we can associate a theory to generic three manifold, which can, will have generically knotted defects inside, and possibly boundaries. Uh, whenever we have a boundary, we need to provide extra data to define a three-dimensional theory. This extra data is the triangulation of the boundary and a polarization of the boundary. Now, for reasons of time, I won't be able to, to give full details of what these mean. Uh, in particular, in, in the context of Simon's theory, this triangulation of the boundary has a certain meaning. Uh, but let me just give a, the basic amount of information that you need. So somehow, when you define this for Simon's uh, partition function on the manifold with boundary and with these triangulations on the boundary, the boundary conditions for Chess Simon's are set up in such a way that you get a, a classical phase space, which is parameterized by a coordinate for each edge of the triangulation. This coordinate is a certain Poisson bracket, which is non-zero only if they share a triangle. And this Poisson bracket is quantized when you look at the full Chess Simon's theory. So uh, if you want to describe the partition function associated to a three-manifold with boundary, this partition function is really a wave function acted upon by the quantization of these operators. And to, to write this wave function as an explicit function, you need to pick a polarization. You need to tell me which of these coordinates are coordinates and which are conjugate momenta. If you want, or if you want, prefer you need to tell me exactly how to realize the various operators as multiplication of the wave function by x and z, say, but also by derivatives as derivatives, depending on, the, on their uh, commutation relations. So once you give me this data, then you can get a three-dimensional theory, a specific three-dimensional theory. Uh, and by construction, this three-dimensional theory has the property that the partition function on the ellipsoid is the same as the sl 2 z partition, uh, simons wave function. sl 2 simons wave function, sorry. So, um, so here we get to the conjecture. If the manifold has no boundaries, only knots inside, then these dimensional theories coincide with the, with the theories that Sergei was talking about, the TM theories. The theories set to a 60 theory uh, compatified on the manifold M. Now, we, if, if the manifold has boundaries, uh, you cannot quite, so you, it takes a little bit of effort to understand what it means to put the six-dimensional theory on a manifold with boundaries. Because there are, as far as I know, the six-dimensional theory has no local boundary conditions, no local supersymmetric boundary conditions. 
because it's a theory of search world fields. So uh, the best you can do is to consider your man the boundary of your manifold as something that is very far away at infinity. So it's more like an asymptotic region for your manifold. Then you're going to get the four, the, a four-dimensional theory, which is the six-dimensional theory compatified on the boundary, and a boundary condition for this four-dimensional theory defined by the, by the rest of the manifold. So to, to, to a manifold with boundaries, the cobordism, we should be able to associate boundary conditions for the four-dimensional theories. And indeed, uh, the three-dimensional conformal theories which we define have all the correct hooks to be attached to the cyber written description of the four-dimensional theory associated to the boundary of M. So our conjecture is that if you couple them properly, this is the same as the infrared limit of this boundary condition. Okay, so um, now I'll try, in the second part of the talk, I'll try to give a more explicit description of how this gluing of the trahedra work, works. But the basic idea is that you, you take, to, you look at the, at the construction of the of the function out of tetrahedron, you associate to each tetrahedron a chiral multiplet, or more precisely the theory T1 that Sergei described. And then you do this gluing by adding abelian gauge fields and appropriate superpotentials. Now, different decomposition of the same manifold into tetrahedra are going to give you a different construction of the Chersamos wave function and a different construction of the three-dimensional theory. You really get a completely different looking Lagrangian. Now, the, this program uh, makes sense only if all these different Lagrangians, all the different descriptions of the theories give you the same infrared conformal field theory. So, it only works if all the theories that you're building out of different decompositions are mirror. So you need to find the, an appropriate web of mirror symmetries which connect all of these different decompositions to the same three manifold. Now, it just so happened that uh, many different decompositions to the tetrahedra of the same manifold can be related by a sequence of elementary moves. So there is just one elementary move that we need to understand is the move where a bipyramid is split either as two tetrahedra or as three. Now, this means that inside this big theory built out of many, many tetrahedra, all that you have to make sure is that some, in, some basic building block uh, made out of two or three tetrahedra give uh, mirror theories. Now, in an appropriate polarization, this combination of the two chiral multiplets, this gluing of the two tetrahedra, correspond to a super QED a U, uh, with one flavor. So basically, a U1 gauge, gauge theory coupled to two chiral multiplets of opposite charge. The two chiral multiplets are just the two tetrahedra, and the U1 gauge theory arises from the gluing and the choice of polarization. On the other side, we get three tetrahedra glued together, so we get three chiral multiplets. As I will describe a little bit better later, the gluing along this internal edge forces you to add a superpotential. So you get the so-called XYZ model, three chiral multiplets with a superpotential XYZ. And this is basically the canonical example of any called true mirror symmetry. So our, our, our Aroni and Annie interligator, Cyber and Strassler, derived this mirror symmetry starting from a known for the N equal four uh, mirror symmetry. So the two theories are the same in the infrared. And by extension, all the theories that we made out of tetrahedra, which give the same geometry, the same three manifold M, are mirror. Actually, there is another important consistency condition which is that the same tetrahedron can be given three different polarizations. Now, uh, this picture doesn't really mean anything. It was just a, uh, an attempt to describe the fact that given a tetrahedron, you need to pick one of the edges as your coordinate for the wave function, and another edge as the conjugate momentum. And there are more or less three different choices because uh, for the tetrahedron, opposite edges carry the same variable because of some constraints that the variable satisfy at vertices. Pretty much the sum of variables associated to, of edges that go inside the same vertex is zero. And uh, it takes a little bit of work, but you can see then that the edge coordinates associated to opposite sides are the same. 
So I can get this edge coordinate and this is a conjugate momentum, or this is an edge coordinate and this is a conjugate momentum, etc. And different polarizations give me a different realization of the three-dimensional theory. So if you if you read to the to the dictionary, you end up with either the, just one the theory of one current multiplet, but possibly with a theory of with a Yuanchov Simon's theory at level one half coupled to a current multiplet. So these look very different theories. But it just so happened that if you look at the monopole operator in this theory, uh, has a conformal dimension that hits the unitarity bound. So it is, it is basically a free carrel. So the, mono, the monopole operator here gives the free carrel field in the mirror description. And so you, you sort of uh, can imagine why the sort of potentials can get a little bit complicated because you know, it, this was given a certain polarization of the tetrahedra, but if I realize this tetrahedra in a different polarization, instead of having an elementary field X here, I might have to put a monopole. Oh, well, nothing to do. So, uh, so this is the general idea that we've been following. Now, uh, I think we more or less understand the, the full glowing procedure at least for SL2. And we are getting, we are starting to learn about uh, the a geometric description of line defects in these three-dimensional conformal field theories. This should be, should be interesting. Uh, we expect these line defects to correspond to surface defects of the sixth theory wrapped along paths in the three manifold. And it would be nice to, to see explicitly geometric interpretation inside the three-dimensional field theory, generalizing the work of uh, uh, Okuda and, and, and the other authors uh, reviewed by Sergei, sorry, reviewed by, by Moore in his talk. Uh, now, we also believe that we can do higher rank pretty easily. Well, easily. We can do higher rank. Uh, so, not just A1 theory, but AN theory, or possibly any ADE six dimensional theory in a three manifold. And as far as we can see, uh, it's still going to be just an abelian gauge theory with chiral multiplets. All that's going to change is, are the rules to, to glue these chiral multiplets together. This is still a little bit surprising, but I guess that really the, the basic point is that somehow we, we have, when we chop out the manifold, we put the ab abelian low energy description of the four dimensional theory on the, on the, along the cuts. And so you end up with a billion uh, an abelian description of the 3D theory. Now, an abelian description of the 4D theory was not that good because it's not, it's not UV complete. It's not an asymptotically free description in four dimensions. But U1 gauge theories are, perf are perfectly fine in three dimensions. So we should be, I mean, we don't see this as a problem. Okay, so this uh, ends the first half of the talk. Now let's try to get a little into more detail about the construction. So first of all, what, what, what do I mean with the ellipsoid partition function? So uh, you saw in the review by Cyberg that you, you can do nice partition functions, nice compatifications of uh, three-dimensional theories with equal to supersymmetry and our charge on a three-sphere. It turns out that you can actually deform this compatification. This was done by Hama, Ozomichi, and Lee, and put it on, a, on an ellipsoid. So, you see, the sphere would have been something like absolute value of z squared plus absolute value of w squared equal to 1. This ellipsoid is a deformation of the metric which preserves the u1 times u1 isometries which are used in localization. So this is still computable by localization. But it has an extra parameter, so it's more fun. And uh, I mean, a, motiv a motivation behind this was to understand the connection with Liville theory. So uh, in the, correct, in the, the usual connection between Liville theory or uh, mapping class group operators of Liville theory and partition function on S3, uh, you always end up with the Liville theory at, with central charge uh, 20, uh, 25 because B is equal to one. So this is an attempt to, to get a more general B, a more general central charge on the Liville theory side which corresponds to the more general H bar in Chersamon's theory. So uh, you saw the relation between H bar and, and B squared in, a, in, in a Professor Gouffer-Cooker's talk. So H bar is more or less 2 pi i B squared. 
Now, uh, we, I will denote in the rest of the talk the partition function on the ellipsoid as psi b. Now, this partition function is not just a number. It doesn't depend only on b and on the theory. Uh, it's actually a function of some holomorphic variables. There is a, a variable for each flavor symmetry of the theory, usually u1, but it could be also uh, non-abelian. So this parameter has two pieces, a real and imaginary part. Uh, again, this was reviewed by, by Cyber Talk. So the, re the real part is a twisted mass for that U1 flavor symmetry. Uh, the imaginary part is proportional to the R charge assignment, to the contribution of this U1 flavor symmetry to the R charge. Uh, and in the, on the ellipsoid, it's modified by this prefactor, B plus one over B, and I think I forgot a one half here. I'm sorry. So this partition function is holomorphic in this variable x. Now, the partition function of a single Kara multiplet is very easy to compute. Well, not very easy. It took uh, a certain amount of work by the uh, Hama, Ozomich, and Lee, but it's con conceptually easy. It's just a one loop determinant. So it takes a little bit of work to put all the pieces of the one loop determinant together. You, get with, you end up with some infinite product of bosons over of fermions over bosons. And this infinite product is a non-special function called as B of x in the Liville theory literature. It's a relative of the quantum dilogarithm. And the partition function of a single chiral multiplet is S B of I Q over two minus X. A Q is B plus one over B. And X is the very variable associated to the favor symmetry that rotates this chiral multiplet. Um, now, if you, now suppose you, have, you start with a bunch of of Kara multiplets and you, and you want to add a superpotential to them, uh, how is the partition function going to be affected? So potential itself is pretty much Q exact uh, in, the, in, the, in the localization. So it's not going to affect the partition function directly. You're not going to see the coefficients of the superpotential in the partition function. But the presence of the superpotential affects the symmetries of the theory clearly. So your superpotential might break some flavor symmetries. If that's the case, you cannot add those flavor symmetries. Uh, you cannot add the variables corresponding to those flavor symmetries in your partition function. Also, for the localization to make sense, uh, the, the superpotential must have R charge too, which, is, which should be more or less the, 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 the correct value for a conformal field theory. So if you put together these two constraints, let me use an example, the XYZ model. So you have three chiral multiplets, each with its own flavor symmetry parameter, X, Y, and Z. But the real part, if, if you look at the sum of X plus Y plus Z, the real part would be the flavor symmetry which rotates the superpotential. So you have to set that to zero. Or if you prefer, the, real, the sum of the twisted masses should be zero in the presence of the superpotential. On the other hand, the overall R charge of the superpotential is the imaginary part of X plus Y plus Z. It's two. Again, I forgot the one. Uh, here there was one and a half times two. So you get that the sum of X plus Y plus Z is just IQ. So the, the final result is the partition function is the product of the partition functions for the three chiral multiplets, but you need to explicitly set Z to IQ minus X minus Y. So this is the partition function of the XYZ model. Now let's get to gauging. Whenever you add a gauge multiplet, uh, things get more interesting because the localization allow the scalar in the gauge multiplet to have whatever zero mode it wants. So the partition function on, on the ellipsoid involves an integral over the possible values of the scalar field in the gauge multiplet. Now the scalar field behaves like a twisted mass in its coupling to the chiral multiplets. So if you're given the, the charges of your chiral multiplets, you need to write the complex parameter associated to each chiral multiplet as a linear combination of the scalar fields in the gauge multiplets and possibly some remaining residual flavor symmetries. Furthermore, uh, whenever you add a gauge multiplet to your theory, the dual of the magnetic field is a new conserved current. So there is a new U1 symmetry which pretty much uh, does not act on the elementary fields, but acts on monopole operators. So there are new twisted masses, which are really phi, phi parameters. I'll denote them as a C prime. 
So the result is they have a partition function which is a function of the z and z primes, and it's pretty much, an, so it's an integral over the scalar fields in the uh, gauge multiplets, and it's pretty much a Fourier transform. You see, you have e to the 2 pi i z prime dot y, and then you have e to the minus i pi y squared. So this y squared is comes from the Simon's uh, couplings. So this pretty much, if you have something like k, the Chern-Simons coupling level k for a gauge field A, you add k y squared to the, to the integral. So you have a Fourier transform with some Gaussian kernel. So these are the rules. So for example, if I want to look at super QD with an f equal to one, which was the, uh, the second, the first member of this mirror symmetry. You need two chiral multiplets with char opposite charge under the gauge symmetry. You can still include a ax axial flavor ch charge that rotates them both in the same direction. And in a finite level parameter, so you simply have the integral of this, or the product of the partition functions with a possible transformers coupling. Ah, sorry, I should have dropped this. In, in QED, there will, not be, there will be no transformers coupling, so here you would have just zero. And then you would have the Fourier transform, the coupling to the finite Lobos parameter. Okay, so these are the things that you should remember. If you gauge a flavor symmetry, you do a Fourier transform with some Gaussian kernel. The effect of this Fourier transform, if you want, is to, uh, well, Fourier transform, Fourier transform with Gaussian kernels are the way you, in, in quantum mechanics, you rotate positions and momentum among each other are the ways you implement metaplectic transformations, symplectic redefinitions of, uh, of your choice of position and momenta, of polarization. So you can sort of see in advance that whenever we need to change polarization in just someone's, in just someone's theory, we're gonna do it by gauging, an appropriate gauging of some flavor symmetry. And then adding the potential allows us to impose some linear constraints on the parameter. So, what are the rules to build the Simon's partition function? Well, uh, to each tetrahedron, you attach a quantum dialogarithm. Every time you glue together tetrahedra around an internal edge, you need to put a linear constraint on the arguments uh, attached to, those, to that edge. And whenever you do a change of polarization uh, of your boundaries, you need to implement it by an appropriate Fourier transform. So, you can, you can see now that given this set of rules, and given the decomposition of the tetrahedron of a manifold into tetrahedra, your hands are tied. There is only one way to realize it uh, as a sequence of operations on three-dimensional theories, abelian gauge theories. In particular, if you look at the quantum dialogarithm uh, associated to tetrahedron by the uh, this quantum dialogarithm is a close relative of the SB function it pretty much differ from it by a Gaussian. So you can see that every time you have a tetrahedron, you need to attach to it a chiral multiplet and a background Chersamos coupling at level one half to account for this Gaussian. Another way to understand that you re require this gauge Chersamos coupling is that if you look at the, if you couple a chiral multiplet to a background gauge field, this background gauge field gets an anomaly. Uh, and the only way to, it, this anomaly is, more, is equivalent to the anomaly for, that you get with an half integral John Simon's uh, interaction. So if you add another half integral John Simon's interaction, you get a non-anomal non coupling. So, so now these are the rules. Uh, to each tetrahedron you attach the scalar multiple to the appropriate John Simon's term. Every time you do change polarization, you do a corresponding gauging of some flavor symmetry and to each internal edge, you attach a superpotential term. So it takes a little bit of work to make sure that these superpotential terms can all, all be defined in the same uh, uh, mirror symmetry frame, but uh, you can show it. And so you get a three-dimensional theory. So what, is the, what are the conclusions? We have conjectured a three-dimensional definition of the theory T of M. Uh, it has many, many different mirror descriptions, but they all define the same infrared theory. For some reason, which are not still clear to us, these are all abelian Chersimon's theories. I mean, okay, we did, by construction this happened, but 
uh, I still don't have a good intuition, physical intuition of why I, this should be possible, but it seems to be possible. And well, so now we have a three-dimensional field theory defined in a sort of pretty elementary way and which gives you a, to a topological invariant of three manifolds and knots. So I, I hope there will be some, some interesting things to do with it. Uh, and as I was saying, we, don't, we have no direct derivation of these three-dimensional theories from six dimensions, but uh, it would be nice to have it. Okay. Um, that's pretty much. Questions? Um, so, why is it that when you compactify from six to three dimensions on the ellipsoid, you get the chern simons partition function on the three manifold? Uh, well, I don't have a, a full answer about that, although I can imagine trying to somehow reduce the six-dimensional theory on the two circles, on the two isometries of the ellipsoid. So this gives, would give a configuration of n equal four superior meals on a segment, where one circle shrinks on one side, the other circle shrinks on the other side. Um, so, so you would have n equal four superior meals on a segment with so the Riclet boundary conditions on one side and Neumann boundary conditions the five boundary conditions on the one side and the S5 boundary condition on the other. Um, I thought that turns off the gauge group completely. It doesn't give turn silence. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, so I don't have a good answer. But uh, since, since you believe it's true, there must be some reason. Yeah, well, there must be some good way to, no, no, but to make it work. But I didn't mean that. <laughs> what was it that suggested this fact? Ah, well, so Sergei uh, reviewed part of the motivation, but for me, the motivation was that uh, I can start from a, from, a, from, a, from AGT and get, imagine having domain walls. So I have a four-dimensional theory on S4, and I can imagine having domain walls for that four-dimensional theory on the equator of S4. And these this domain walls will... Uh, implement transformations on the space of conformal blocks. Transformations that can have a geometric interpretation, so they can look like a cobordism, uh, a three-dimensional manifold with two boundaries coupled to, to the... F f I mean, this should give somehow a, a domain wall which couples to the four-dimensional theories on the north and south hemisphere. Uh, so, there should be co so it looks like certain three-dimensional theories that live on domain walls can compute cobordisms uh, mapping class group operations for for uh, for level theory for conformal blocks, and so by by putting enough, you know, uh, as far as I can see, these uh, these cobordisms, these these operations are the same as some of those wave functions. So, uh, I mean, in a sense, Chersamos theory, analytically continued Chersamos theory, is the three-dimensional. TFT behind conformal blocks. So that so. last statement is all I'm understanding out of it. So A, G, and T shows that that we more or less see physical states of chern simons theory associated to a Riemann surface. Right, and so you can hope. Okay. And cobaldism. Why the ellipsoid comes in? But uh, that would that would make us hope that chern simons theory would come in. Somewhere. Well, if you do Piston localization on S four it reduces to Kapustin localization on the equator. So when you have a four-dimensional theory coupled to a three-dimensional theory on the equator, you get uh, the contribution of the domain wall theory is the same as the S3 partition function of whatever degrees of freedom you put on the domain wall. Uh, now, I, I still don't know how to do an S4B, so how to get a partition function on S4, which actually gives me uh, Devil theory with generic B, but I would hope that it's some deformation which gives rise to an S3B on the equator. Okay, thanks. 
Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank speaker again.